Hi, my name is James Young and I'm going to read an extract from The Love of Singular Men by Victor Hedinger, which will be published in the UK by Pirini Press in June this year. The Love of Singular Men is uh, a novel set partly in the Rio de Janeiro of the 1970s when Brazil was under the rule of a military dictatorship and partly in the country's more recent past. It is about the innocence of first love between two young boys, the narrator Camilo and Cosme, an orphan who comes to live in Camilo's family home and how quickly that innocence can be shattered by violence and hate. This extract is from the beginning, near the beginning of the book, as well as Camilo and Cosme. It features Joanna, Camilo's younger sister, and Maria Aina, a neighbour who helps look after the children. Love of Singular Men Joanna dived back into the water. After swimming aimlessly for a few minutes, she came over again. She grinned, displaying the gaps in her teeth. I knew that grin. She wanted to tell me something. My sister was mortified by those gaps, but grinned whenever she wanted to reveal or discover secrets. To show that her mouth held no mysteries, that her tongue would do no harm. She was an open child. When mum died at the beginning of the century, Joanna smiled broadly then broke the news. Mum didn't water the plants. She didn't water them again today, she said, making a face like a sleuth. To prove it, she jumped out of the pool, skipped over to the flower beds, and came back with a few fern leaves. I pinched one, and it crumbled between my fingers. The sun had scorched Mum's garden. She couldn't have watered it in weeks. Do you want to ask me something with her eyebrows? I flapped my lips in a gossipy, fish-like manner. She exhaled, imitating the adults, hands on hips, rolling her eyes. She knew a lot more than me, but even so, she knew nothing at all. I had only one fear. If the plants dried out, they'd soon turn yellow. If they turned yellow, autumn would come early and summer would be over. With no summer, there'd be no summer holidays. We'd have to go back to school. We had no idea of the problems that had plagued our parents' marriage in recent months. We didn't even know who ran the country. We lived under the weird dictatorship of childhood. We looked but didn't see, listened but understood nothing, spoke and were largely ignored. But we were happy under that regime. Like a thick shroud, the fabric of our young lives shielded us completely. The first rip appeared that day. The sound of our father's car reached our ears. Light invaded our hiding place. Vroom, vroom. There was his corsel turning the corner. It stopped in front of the gate and growled again, vroom vroom, demanding to be let in. No one went to open the gate. Mum appeared in the balcony, exchanged a few words with Maria Aina, made as if to stay, then went back inside. Dad, who was lifting up the iron gate, didn't see her. He parked in front of the pool, honked his horn, and the sun struck the mucous yellow bodywork of the corsel and blazed right into our eyes. Maria Aina got up slowly, her skeleton frame weary, skeletal frame weary and stiff, and stood gazing down on us. Joanna brought my staff and helped me up, her gap tooth smile demanding to know what gifts Dad had brought us, because he always bought, brought presents back from his trips. He got out of the car, slammed the door, and exhaled heavily as he adjusted his trousers. This heat. Engine off, the corsel purr purred asthmatically, then finally went to sleep. My sister gave a squeal and hurriedly wrapped herself in a towel. It was only then I saw his head framed by the rear window. The shaved head of a boy was but as much a boy as me. But I had a full head of hair and I wasn't that coffee with watered down milk colour. I was red in the summer and greenish white in winter. His skull must always have been that same mixture of colours. He looked strong. I was skinny, more breakable, lame. But his eyes looked fragile, like the neck of a small bird or a puppy that finds itself caught in a rat trap. My first instinct was to hate him. I wanted to poke out his eyeballs, make him disappear from the face of the earth. Who knows why? Hate has neither reason nor purpose. Love has purpose, but not hate. Love perpetuates the human race, protects us from sterility and the deadliest solitudes. Hate is bigger, has more tentacles, and speaks with more mouths than love. Love is a physio physiological function. Hate is a sublime and furious hunger. 
It's the reason we're the dominant species on the planet. Hate is the perpetration of the species. I hated Dad's voice saying, come on, come on out. And I hated how slowly the boy slunk through the half-open door of the car. And I hated his name, Mrs. Cosme, Dad said. And I hated the baby blue shirt he was wearing, bought by Dad, I was sure. And his awkward run into the wings of my father, who wrapped him in that big embrace of his. I hated with an ancient hate, in a language only Maria Aina could understand, and which I would never decipher. Thank you.